Thank you very much, Professor Monica schwartz frizel It was a fascinating uh, analysis, and we certainly at Tel Aviv University we shall use your definitions and your empirical findings. <clears throat> uh, our next and last lecture in this, uh, this panel is by uh, Professor Lars Rensman, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at John Cabot University in Rome. Uh, prior, to, prior to joining the John Cabot University, uh, he was an assistant professor of the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Program at the, of the Political Science in the Department of Political Science at the University of Michigan and Arbor. He is also a permanent fellow of the Moses Mendelssohn Center, University of Potsdam, and visiting fellow at the Institute of Social Sciences at the Humboldt University, Berlin. His work focuses <clears throat> on global political theory and global and European politics. He has many publications have appeared in journals, including the European Journal of Political Theory, Politics, Religion, Ideology, German Politics and Society, Patterns of Prejudice, Political Science, and others. Recent publications, Gaming the World, How Sports Are Reshaping Global Politics and Culture, with, together with Andrei Markovic from Princeton University, 2010, Politics and Resentment, Anti-Semitism and Counter-Cosmopolitanism in the European Union. Together, edited with Julius, our guest, another of our lecturers here, pre presenters with Julius Sheps. Uh, Professor Rensman will speak now about elite discourse and public opinion on anti-Semitism in Israel, the case of Germany, and comparative European perspective. In order to save several minutes, I shortened your very long list of publications. So, uh, please. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, introduction. Sorry for uh, uh, figuring out that this PowerPoint uh, system. Thanks for inviting me um, and having the very pleasant position of being the very last speaker on a very long uh, conference day. But uh, um, I hope uh, you will um, uh, spend a few more minutes uh, with me. Now, uh, Professor schwarz Frizel is a tough act to follow. Um, and uh, some of the uh, findings that I will present will converge, and I will not talk about anti-Semitism and the radical right today, um, and, uh, um, uh, but you will see that, uh, again, there's a certain uh, convergence of, uh, um, uh, of findings um, in my empirical work um, on anti-Semitism. Uh, now, what, what I will focus on, as indicated, is um, uh, the uh, um, particularly public opinion and elite discourse as far as it pertains to uh, uh, both anti-Semitism and, and Israel. Uh, now, one thing, I have a few, let's say, um, even uh, different from uh, Professor schwarz I have also a few good news. Uh, some not so good news, but also some good news. Um, and the good news in terms of uh, empirical survey findings, which of course don't do not go into the depth of this qualitative analysis that we've just heard, is that <laughs> ultimately uh, Germany is, doesn't stand out in Europe, by and large. When we talk about public opinion, it doesn't stand out. There are places which are worse, Sweden, for example, Spain, when it comes to public opinion, Germany doesn't stand out. Um, now, clearly, um, when we look at the potential or uh, diagnosed rise of, of anti-Semitism, um, in uh, the general German public um, uh, and uh, uh, acts of anti-Semitic violence, uh, 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 there are data that actually are reflected all across Europe. And we, uh, together with Professor Schoeps, we did a, uh, uh, several comparative studies, um, European comparative studies on the subject. Um, uh, so in 2009, for example, as you know here, um, uh, as the Kanto Center also established, um, uh, we had the highest amount of anti-Semitic violent acts ever since 1945, and that's European-wide uh, a, a peak. Uh, we have um, statements which are widely shared among uh, uh, Germans and Europeans, roughly about 50% uh, um, 
that believe uh, pretty much that kind of stereotype that uh, Jews are actually Jews and uh, uh, it's actually framed uh, in surveys very often Jews, uh, respectively Israel, is doing the same thing to the Palestinians, um, uh, what the Nazis did to the Jews. So ultimately, the Palestinians, uh, the Jews aren't uh, any better than the Nazis, uh, which classifies as anti-Semitism also according to the uh, uh, UMC, uh, the European Union Monetary uh, uh, Agency's definition. Um, and we also have a blurring of distinctions, uh, not that this is anything new, not that uh, anti-Zionism or so-called new anti-Semitism is actually very new. Uh, uh, as long as the state of Israel exists, there have been resentments against Israel and they have been peaking uh, certainly since 1967, so it's really nothing new. But there's definitely also in public discourse a blurring of boundaries between uh, so-called Israel critique, uh, Israel criticism and anti-Semitism. We've seen uh, boycotts from the BDS movement uh, organized, uh, but also more explicit ones, as in the city of Rome, uh, uh, where people are not stop uh, um, uh, a few of these very active groups, including the, the Casa Pound uh, right-wing extremists. Now I do talk about the radical right. Um, uh, a poster uh, plastered the, the, the city of Rome with posters saying, anti-Semitism is no crime, uh, the Holocaust didn't happen, and, uh, um, and Jews should be boycotted, um, uh, not uh, Israel alone. Um, but we also have these kind of interesting bl uh, blurring boundaries. And when the uh, region of Catalonia or uh, uh, Catalonia uh, canceled the Holocaust Memorial Day in 2009 in response to the events in Gaza. Now, what the two things have in common, uh, that's up to the uh, 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 regional government of Catalonia to know, to explain to us. Um, but they felt that this is a... a um, uh, relation. So that's the kind of background. What I will present now in my uh, 25 minutes is um, basically five hypotheses that I hope, uh, um, I don't know how much time we'll have to discuss them here, but uh, at least as a, as a take home to, uh, to, to reflect upon uh, and contest, if you will. Um, uh, and the first hypothesis is, I already indicated, uh, the German public opinion is not uh, doesn't stand really out uh, when it comes to uh, um, thinking about Jews and thinking about Israel. Uh, it's pretty much in tune um, with uh, the European average public perception. Um, we have negative perception, uh, perception among uh, roughly 25% that are anti-Jewish and uh, roughly 50, a majority that uh, has a strong or uh, a moderate anti-Israel uh, 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 views um, uh, and uh, and that again, like we have uh, cases where that's much uh, the figures are much higher than the cases where the figures are lower, such as in the UK. Um, the second hypothesis I will talk about here is um, uh, we need to take into account. And this is why we talk about public opinion and elite discourse. There are different clusters. There are different people. Now we've heard a lot about lawyers and. Uh, 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 and doctors, um, um, uh, but I would classify that still as part of general public opinion. Um, uh, um, and the difference is between that, of course, and elite opinion is what is published in Der Spiegel and Die Welt and in uh, the media, um, and political elite opinion, which is another matter, uh, what the political elite expresses in terms of Jews and Israel. Um, and so there are different, uh, uh, very significant differences, uh, in particular that's true for the, for the German case. And we also have, particularly in the German case, uh, and that's some of the good news, uh, some uh, uh, forms of uh, more vocal opposition to anti-Israelism uh, and anti-Semitism, uh, more vocal at least than in many other uh, European uh, countries. My third hypothesis is that anti-Semitism um, and here we get into the more problematic uh, uh, arenas. Anti-Semitism is today, as we already learned also from uh, Professor schwarz frizel mostly viewed as a problem of the past. It no longer exists. There's a relativization and denial of the existence of anti-Semitism. It's a matter of, the, of, of history. Today we have racism against other minorities, Islamophobia, but really anti-Semitism, that was, you know, that's a historical phenomenon that basically ended by and large 1945. That's a very common perception, it's a very problematic perception, because when you want to address and thematize anti-Semitism, you run into this trap and this problem, which, uh, uh, because really the, the general perception it no longer exists. 
Uh, so addressing modernized anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism in its classical form, or modernized anti-Semitism, that is, just as we have cultural racism or modernized racism, subtle, indirect uh, uh, allusions, anti-Jewish, uh, uh, often using the Zionist now as a substitute of code, a coded anti-Semitism. Um, if you address that, you're uh, running into uh, a majoritarian rejection. Uh, and uh, again and again, time and again now, uh, we have uh, the notion that there's an anti-Semitismus coil. It's, it's a common saying now. You see it on talk shows. It's an anti-Semitismus coil, uh, uh, which means uh, the anti-Semitism club that you get. Um, and the interesting thing about this, and, and I've, I've seen them actually as several anti-Semitism researchers saying, talking about the anti-Semitismus coil, um, uh, anti-Semitism anti -Semitism club. The interesting thing about this is um, really the term coil, club, associating that with anti-Semitism or Auschwitz or fascism is a trope that originates in the radical right. Initially in the 1960s, then to a uh, uh, former, uh, not really direct colleague of mine, Hans Helmut Knutter, who wrote a, a political science professor uh, in Bonn, who wrote a book on uh, uh, the fascismus coiler, uh, that the left has used the fascism club uh, um, uh, to silence critique or silence uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, political opposition. And then it turns into the Auschwitz coiler, uh, which is a common saying after the Walser debate uh, in the 1980, 1990, uh, 1998. Um, so, uh, and now this has turned into the anti-Semitism. So it's always clubs. Someone is running around with a club uh, um, trying to uh, um, uh, smash the brains or heads of uh, um, uh, and intimidate uh, the German public. That's a common trope. Um, and so when uh, someone addresses anti-Semitism, it is not viewed as a problem that we need to discuss, but ultimately as a, someone coming with a club with hostile intentions, a fabricated myth, and very often, in fact, that is linked to the notion that it's fabricated myth, myth uh, created, used, instrumentalized by a so-called Israel uh, lobby or Jewish lobby, uh, um, uh, uh, respectively. Um, hypothesis number four. Um, there are a lot of widespread myths about anti-Semitism and criticism of Israel, uh, and that are, these are shared very often by elites and the uh, general public. Um, uh, these misperceptions um, are, uh, and here I disagree with uh, Professor schwarz frizel uh, uh, to some extent uh, can be related to what I call secondary anti-Semitism, initially Peter Schoenbach in 1961 called secondary anti-Semitism. That doesn't mean secondary, that it's secondary in its status, that it's less, uh, uh, less vile or less dangerous. But it simply means, uh, that's at least the, the, the hypothesis here, it refers to the memory uh, um, of Auschwitz, an unwanted memory um, that ultimately Jews represent. And Jews are blamed, basically, for representing this, uh, this uh, um, uh, um, memory. I'll go into this in a second when I discuss these five hypotheses. Um, so, uh, and in that context, Israel very often today, uh, uh, or the Zionists, but particularly Israel and the state of Israel, serves as Leon Paul Yaakov has called it once, and uh, Professor schwarz rizel cited it, uh, uh, as the collective Jew, as a projection, uh, a matrix of projection um, that uh, in order to, where you can express legitimate anti-Jewish resentment. So all kinds of anti-Semitic tropes can be just attached to this, this container, projection mattress of the Middle East conflict, and you dump it there, and basically, uh, and once you, 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 you refer to Israel, it's only criticism of Israel. It's no longer anti-Semitism. You kind of have clean hands. Um, my fifth and final hypothesis um, uh, in the public debate, we observe actually a constant seesaw. It's not a one-dimensional picture. Uh, uh, sometimes you have very uh, strong reactions of the German uh, 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 elite, uh, uh, media, uh, a political elite, very strong reactions against anti-Semitism. We've seen that in uh, uh, ultimately, even though delayed in 2002, when uh, uh, Jürgen Möllermann, a, a free democratic politician at the time, tried to launch an anti-Israel uh, um, uh, a campaign with anti-Semitic overturns, it was actually uh, uh, with uh, some anti-Semitic tunes, uh, it was rejected uh, 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 by and large. We also have the case in the Grass debate, I will briefly, if I have the time, uh, will uh, address, um, uh, where you also saw just last year a very strong reaction and uh, um, uh, uh, dismissal of, of this old man 
uh, writing about uh, the Jewish state of Israel and blaming it for threatening world peace. Uh, but then you have different response, which as we re uh, uh, discussed in the case of the uh, Augstein debate. So you see partly eroding boundaries. You also see a constant, uh, uh, see, so you also particularly see a very polarized debate on the subject. It's, uh, it's really, really uh, hot potato. Um, so, uh, once again, to my, my first hypothesis, ultimately, uh, uh, as I said before, Germany does not stay, stand out in the European context when we look at surveys. Um, some countries display, uh, in fact, a significantly higher hostility towards Jews in Israel, but there are also countries where uh, there's a lower uh, display of uh, hostility. Um, uh, we also find, when we look at uh, just public opinion, the opinion of the general public, as opposed to elite opinion, uh, and elite discourse, um, uh, we find uh, um, that uh, um, uh, general, in the general public, when we have these occurrences of anti-Israelism, very often it's, uh, 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 there's a strong correlation with anti-Semitism, meaning also uh, this kind of uh, uh, common device to say it's only criticism of, uh, of Israel. Of course, you can, there's lots of criticism of Israel, but with the strength of anti-Israelism, of, of anti with, the, with the fearfulness of, of, of anti-Israelism, uh, there's also uh, a rising intensity and likelihood that uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic mot motives are, are related to that. So the stronger someone feels about Israel must go, uh, Israel disturbs the world peace, the um, uh, more, uh, the stronger is the likelihood that uh, anti-Semitism is involved. Uh, another interesting finding is uh, anti-Israelism uh, from an experimental uh, psychological studies that uh, uh, we have correlates also with other forms of racism. Uh, it's not just anti-Semitism that correlates with racism, but it's also, in fact, anti-Israelism. So people who have very strong anti-Israel feelings at the very same time, so they pretend to care so much about the Palestinians, very often they have hold very strong stereotypes about the very same group. Um, and, uh, and also on the good news side, uh, what we have in Germany is uh, uh, comparable only in the Czech Republic and a few other places, you do have a, a small but significant pro-Israel and anti active anti-anti-Semitic uh, uh, minority. So uh, to illustrate uh, these data, for example, classical anti-Semitic uh, stereotype. Now these are the traditional kind of survey questions that we have. Uh, the Jews have too much power in international financial markets. You see Germany uh, here uh, placed uh, um, with 22% um, uh, rather at the lower uh, uh, end, um, different from, let's say, Spain, for example, where three-fourths of the uh, um, population believe that. Um, when we uh, uh, look at this kind of general Jews, uh, views, uh, negative views of Jews in Europe um, and combine various uh, data and polls and, uh, uh, and create indicators for that, um, you uh, see also, once again, uh, a rise over, by and large uh, over the years uh, in Germany, 25% here in the middle of it. Um, now, uh, it becomes more uh, um, problematic in terms of these uh, uh, opinion polls when we look at this uh, already cited, cited uh, opinions about uh, Israel and uh, what the Israelis do, what the state of Israel does to the Palestinians. Um, there we have also varying data depending to the different polls, but 30 to 40 percent at least that uh, um, believe, uh, either strongly believe or uh, uh, generally believe that um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, Israel's behavior was no different from the behavior of the Nazis and uh, what, the, what Israel does to the Palestinians is a war of extermination and so really literally it's the same thing that the Nazis did. Um, one interesting uh, last point on, uh, on public opinion, uh, um, also in accordance with uh, Professor schwarz uh findings, uh, there is really no, there's certainly left-wing uh, uh, anti-Semite po political organizations that are promoting anti-Semitic uh, views and uh, a few political representatives even of the left party uh, among them, uh, but there's no really, when it comes to the level of public opinion, there's no real political alignment. So you cannot say like, you know, there's all, uh, among people who vote left are more anti-Semites or people who vote CDU or FDP or, um, uh, that's pretty much, uh, um, uh, um, there's real no, no, no clear-cut uh, left or right uh, political alignment. So, to my second hypothesis, it's a little bit dark here, um, uh, it, there's, there, uh, we need to, if we analyze public opinion in elite discourse, uh, we need to make differentiations. We need to look at different clusters. And um, 
um, here I'm just distinguishing between four. Um, on the one hand, we have a political elite that by and large is, is, is uh, pro-Israel and sensitive to the, uh, to the issue of anti-Semitism. How much they do about it is a different story maybe, but uh, by and large pro-Israel uh, and sensitive uh, to anti-Semitism. You have, of course, also some uh, people, particularly here in the left party, who uh, remain seated when Shimon Peres uh, comes uh, to the Bundestag and to make a political act of that, that they oppose the very presence of someone like Shimon Peres. Or you have controversies about uh, uh, making Hezbollah, uh, um, uh, uh, um, naming it a terrorist organization, which actually uh, um, Germany and France oppose uh, to do, even after that evidence of, of Burgers. Or you have controversies um, in, in Parliament about a strong statement uh, in the flotilla uh, situation. But by and large, there's a, there's a politi political elite, uh, a pro-Israeli view, where Germany stands out, in fact. Um, compared to many other uh, European countries. Now, when it comes to the public elite, that's a different story. You actually see, uh, um, and it's completely also in sync with my findings, uh, a very strong criticism of Israel all around, even though the media at the same time basically uh, um, insinuates that it's illegitimate, illegitimate to, to criticize Israel. Um, so when it comes to the public elite, there's much more hostility, and the same is the case uh, uh, dominance of hostility, as already indicated in general public opinion, uh, and that is just um, uh, opposed with a, 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 a though um, existing vocal minority that is pro-Israel. Now, um, my third hypothesis, uh, then, um, uh, where we get into the really problematic terrain, um, uh, anti-Semitism, as I said, is mostly viewed as a problem of the past, and if it's only seen as a problem of the past, um, then uh, we don't really need to deal with that, or it's actually even irrational or mysterious why on earth would you deal with it if it no longer exists. So there must be some sinister motives behind that. Um, so according to a widespread public perception, anti-Semitism is mostly this problem of the past, and that is already the starting point of uh, many problems, this denial of anti-Semitism. Um, uh, as I indicated, if you address anti-Semitism then, uh, very often it's automatically, as it is uh, apparently or allegedly known, uh, doesn't exist, it's an unjustified, illegitimate reproach. Um, uh, and this reproach then is generally reputed, um, uh, both uh, on the level of public opinion and uh, in part uh, um, elite discourse, is generally refuted, is seen as unsubstantiated, as irrational, and thus can only be understood as fabricated, um, instrumentalized, used, serving the interests of a powerful lobby, and particularly and more, more outspoken now these days, an Israeli or even Jewish lobby. Um, my fourth hypothesis has indicated um, a, a problem that we are dealing with um, uh, um, when we look at uh, both public opinion and elite discourse um, is that there are several uh, myths about um, uh, uh, um, uh, anti-Semitism and criticism of Israel. And I want to just mention two here. One, Israel or Israel's government is the cause of anti-Semitism. That is so common today to, to, to say that and perceive it that way. Uh, so something happens in Israel and that causes anti-Semitism. We find that also in some of these letters uh, uh, cited by Professor Schwarz uh, Friesel. Um, Israel is the cause of anti-Semitism. Now really think about it. Um, and unfortunately, people don't like to think so much, um, but uh, that's just the way it is. Um, uh, there's really no empirical evidence for this claim that there's any relationship. And then once again, I've, I've seen colleagues making these, 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 uh, uh, these claims. Uh, would we ask an African leader uh, that fails or launches the war, would you would say, like, this is the cause of racism? Um, you would not say that. And I've never heard of anyone saying it. And it's good that no one says it because it's nonsense. Just as it is nonsense to believe that a resentment, which has nothing to do with reality or empirical facts, can be caused by the actions of a state or a government or a person, right? So uh, you don't become an anti-Semite because uh, uh, um, there's a, a Jewish person, person who was corrupt, right? That's like there's no correlation between the two. And so African dictators don't cause racism in Europe. Israel, the state of Israel, doesn't do that either. What does engender and help uh, uh, anti-Semitism is the discourse about Israel. 
uh, the hostility about Israel. That uh, um, uh, uh, can, uh, um, uh, if anything, uh, engender anti-Semitism. Now, uh, the second myth, it's a uh, uh, very common myth that it's taboo to criticize Israel and Germany. You can't do that. There's no way if you criticize Israel and Germany, you know, uh, you'll be sanctioned, you'll be subject to the anti-Semitism spoiler. Um, and the Israel lobby curtails uh, free speech globally. Now, uh, once again, as Professor uh, uh, schwarz Frizzelli indicated, there are studies out, Israel is the most criticized country in the German media. Sometimes in Hurton Peaks, uh, uh, America, is up there, but it's really, um, uh, um, uh, when we look at, a, make a serious content analysis, not just in German, once again, the European content, uh, uh, context, um, Israel and the US are the most criticized countries. So if that's the case, then uh, you know, where does that uh, trope come from that uh, uh, um, it's a taboo to criticize Israel? In fact, we see some kind of, sometimes a kind of uh, obsessive form of uh, focus on Israel uh, criticism, and that's what uh, we usually refer to this kind of double standards. Uh, you wouldn't see the similar kind of criticism with other countries. In fact, even the term Israel critique or Israel criticism actually only exists for Israel. Uh, there is no Egypt criticism or Egypt critique. Uh, that word doesn't exist in the German language. It's only Israel critique, Israel criticism. It's the only term where you, where you attach the critique to an entire country. Um, uh, so that's an interesting phenomenon as such. Um, um, I'm not going to go much into that, uh, uh, um, the claim that ultimately secondary anti-Semitism plays a role, that Jews and Israel are very often in the German uh, public identified with the historical guilt and the historical responsibility, the feeling of guilt, um, and this is an unwanted uh, collective memory, and so uh, it's a psychological drive to denigrate Jews and the uh, state of Israel, among uh, many, uh, in order to uh, um, uh, uh, get even, if you will. Um, um, and uh, equating Israel with Nazis, it's a, it's a good way of doing that. Um, uh, and as uh, indicated before, Israel here now often serves as a projection matrix to express so-called legitimate anti-Jewish resentment uh, across uh, all consolidated EU democracies. So I'm not going to skip that because I want to be stay in time. Um, I just want to give you uh, uh, um, a few examples. I'm not going to go into the the, uh, the Grass debate and, and the Augstein debate. Um, uh, um, in the, uh, but I do want to indicate, um, uh, as I said before, uh, that Grass, who wrote a poem um, on uh, Israel being a you know, big threat to, to, to world peace, and he's kind of forced to say it, uh, things that need to be said, I must say it. Um, which reminds me a little bit of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the Balzer uh, speech of 1998, uh, that where he stood in the Paulskirche in Frankfurt, trembling in light of his own audacity, uh, which is uh, the kind of tone that you find in the Grass Prom. So he's like so audacious and he's trembling while he's writing with his last ink, as uh, uh, Grass uh, writes. But the interesting thing is, it got really was broadly refuted in the in the uh, when it comes to elite discourse, elite opinion, a very critical response uh, to Grass, to this uh, rumblings by an old man, as someone uh, wrote, and uh, some refer to his Nazi past. Um, there was one exception, I do want to mention one exception, Thomas Niels in Tagesschau.de, who actually wrote uh, after this poem, in response to this poem, Grass should now also receive the Nobel Peace Prize, not just the uh, uh, Peace Prize for Literature, um, but now he's unfortunately threatened by, quote, furiously presented motivation variations of the Jewish and German-Israeli lobby in the Federal Republic. Um, um, I'm also going to uh, skip uh, 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 the debate about circumcision. Uh, it just indicates that the Grass debate last year, the circumcision debate uh, uh, then, the Augstein debate that followed, there are constant debates uh, about anti-Semitism, which as such is a peculiar thing because it no longer exists, but we constantly talk about it. So the interesting dialectic that there's, a, uh, there's permanent uh, debates on the subject that as such is uh, um, by and large uh, negated. Um, uh, on the circumcision uh, debate, just one uh, wonderful uh, comment from the Wochenzeitung Freitag, the Mossad will not employ a killer commando such as circumcision such a circumcision of German authority, he is playing with circumcision uh, uh, um, uh, 
uh, as a Jewish uh, uh, um, religious uh, practice and uh, the circumcision of Germany, um, uh, circumcision of German authority, uh, Netanyahu and his ultra-right Minister of Interior will not dare, but you do ask yourself in face of the verbal misfires by the Central Committee, who do they represent? The German Jews? Or do they, after all, only view themselves as the fifth column of Netanyahu and his gang? And here we see this dissociation of, uh, of Jews uh, actually not belonging. Uh, they are not just foreigners, they are actually representatives of uh, Israel. And the fifth column is a classical anti-Semitic uh, stereotype. Uh, um, uh. Now, again, I'm not going to go into uh, um, the Augstein controversy. I just do want to say that um, some of that, I, I agree with uh, Professor schwarz -Frizel. some of the things, particularly uh, um, his claim that the Netanyahu government keeps the world on a leash with an ever-swelling war chant, does elude, in a classical uh, anti-Semitic way, does elude to uh, um, uh, the Jews uh, controlling the world, uh, Netanyahu and small Israel controlling the world, um, and keeps the world on a leash um, uh, and uh, drives it into wars, which is again like Jews drive secretly the world into wars. Uh, um, or his comment about the uh, Haredim uh, being um, uh, following the law of revenge, uh, which is again another classical stereotype. Now the interesting thing here, and I'll conclude with that, is that uh, uh, here uh, the, the uh, rejection of anti-Semitism, whatever you want to think about, the Wiesenthal Center's uh, uh, listing, um, there was widespread solidarity with and support of Augstein in the media. Uh, and here, what the interesting thing is not actually the support necessarily, but what some of the uh, people said, um, uh, among others, uh, Die Zeit, uh, which asks, uh, who hates here whom? Wiesenthal Center defames critic of Israel. The reckless use of the anti-Semitism reproach is common, but this explodes everything. Maybe both Israel and its lobby went nuts. So it's not really actually going into the, uh, um, the, the details of uh, of the controversy. We do have a minority of few who are also critical of uh, these texts uh, uh, and once again an ongoing debate. To conclude uh, my talk, um, we clearly continue to face a polarized climate um, and, uh, uh, in which anti-Semitism and anti-Israel resentments are uh, present. Uh, there is a salient issue, no matter uh, in which direction the controversy goes. Uh, it goes in various uh, uh, ways, but it's a salient issue. Uh, in terms of public opinion, Germany is very European, better or worse. Um, uh, uh, while we do have, uh, uh, also stand out in having a, a quite vocal opposition to anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism. There are specific legacies uh, that play a role, as you all know, when you study uh, German history and uh, uh, German society. Uh, there are sp specific legacies that do play a role and shape this discourse. Um, um, and we uh, face, um, uh, to some extent, in these ongoing controversies, an erosion of discursive boundaries in the sense that you've got to toughen up. Uh, uh, the, the discourse is getting rougher. Um, the terms that are used are tougher. Um, and that is an erosion of boundaries. The, the, this kind of cushioning of, of, uh, of discourse is kind of gone. It's a very tough discursive climate now. Um, uh, that is indeed, yes, that's right, that's right. That is indeed also uh, uh, European. And uh, in that context, there is the opportunity also on the public level, not just on the level of attitudes of public opinion, but of elite discourse that anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism uh, gain space, that they have more ideological space to legitimately raise uh, uh, certain uh, views. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, being Jewish in the 21st century uh, in Germany also means, will continue to mean, facing uh, anti-Semitism and uh, uh, its denial. That is, uh, on the sour note, uh, also the, the sad side of uh, my uh, analysis. Thank you for your attention.